Acts chapter 6. We're continuing our study through this book of the first century church. And the theme as we go through the series is, where's the church? And every Sunday morning, we're going to try to provide an answer. The answer this morning is, where's the church? She's out in the world making disciples. The last thing Jesus said as he was ascending back to the Father is go into all the world and make disciples. It could even be said that the one job of the church is to make disciples. Now, what is a disciple? Well, technically, a disciple is a learner. Uh, A disciple is an apprentice. Uh, A disciple attaches him or herself to a leader, to a teacher. And the aim is that you would become just like that teacher, just like that leader in every way. That's why Jesus calls us his disciples. When I think of what it means to become a growing disciple, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis in his book, The Chronicles of Narnia. There's a phrase in those stories that repeats itself again and again. And the phrase is moving further up and further in to Narnia. In the last book, book number seven, it's called The Last Battle. Uh, The pagan god of the stories is a god that C.S. Lewis invented called Tash. And at the end of the stories, the warriors of Tash are attacking Aslan. Aslan's the king, the lion, the Christ figure. And the warriors of Tash are attacking the warriors of Aslan. And one of the children from our world is named Peter. He's the king. See the, the symbolism there, Peter the the church, and uh, Emmett, his whole life, has hated Aslan and despised him and fought against him. And Aslan joins the battle. The warrior Emmett is petrified. All the stories he'd heard about Aslan must be true. He really is the king. And he was expected to lose his life. But Aslan, in the midst of the battle, came up to Emmett, breathed on him, and listened to what happens next. Emmett says, He breathed on me and took away the trembling from my limbs and caused me to stand upon my feet. He welcomed me this enemy, into Narnia. And after that, he said, we should meet again one day, but that I must go further up and further in. That's what happens in the Christian life. Jesus comes to his enemies and breathes on us and gives us his spirit, and takes away our sin, and strengthens our weak needs. And he says, we will meet again one day. But until that time, keep moving further up and further in, further up and further in. And all through the stories, the children and the um, members of, of Aslan's country are constantly invited to go further up and further in. You know, it happened in the Old Testament. It wasn't called Narnia. It was called Canaan. In Old Testament Israel, the church in the Old Testament was to go further up and further in to the promised land of Canaan. And in the New Testament, the church, the true Israel, is called to go further up and further in the promised land of grace. In Acts 6 and 7... Luke, the writer, describes how the number of converts are increasing. And three times in the passage, he uses the word disciple. 
And what we learn from this passage is, is you don't have converts and then the people that are really committed and really want to sort of make a difference, they're disciples. And then there's some people who are converts, but discipleship is sort of optional and they opt out. No, the Bible knows of no such thing. The Bible says every single person who's a convert to Christ is a disciple of Christ. And every person who's received Christ is invited and called further up and further in to all that Christ has and all that Christ is. Let's find out what it means to be a disciple this morning. Let's all stand out of reverence for God's Word. I'm going to cover parts of uh, chapter 7 in Stephen's speech, but we're really going to focus primarily on Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Hear God's Word. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Folks, this is God's very word, and he gave it to us because he longs for us to grow further up and further in as disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thankfully, disciples aren't people that have it together. Disciples aren't just the really committed, but anyone who knows Christ personally and is resting in the finished work of Jesus. We are, by definition, disciples. So lead us, Holy Spirit, this morning, further up and further into Jesus. For your praise and glory. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So Luke writes Acts under the inspiration of the Spirit so we might become acquainted with with the first century church. But Luke also write Acts under the inspiration of the Spirit so that we might learn to imitate the first century church. What happens in this passage, many people calls the creation of the first diaconate, the creation of deacons, the apostles, the teachers, Peter calls them in 1 Peter, uh, elders. So the church had the elders, that's who Jesus ordained as elders, and then when churches were planted, uh, Paul said, make sure you ordain elders in every place, 
But then here in this passage, there are certain people in the church in Jerusalem that were overlooked when it comes to the distribution of food. The the passage calls them the Hellenists. The Hellenists were Jews who only spoke Greek. Now, most Jews of the Old Testament understood Hebrew and Aramaic, and the original copies of the Old Testament were in Hebrew and Aramaic. And as a result, sometimes there was an air of superiority by the Hebraic Jews over the Hellenist, because we know Hebrew and we know Aramaic, and you jokers only know Greek. Well, as a result of that prejudice, the widows, some of them, of the Greeks were being overlooked. And the elders said, this is very important, but We have been called clearly to primarily a ministry of prayer and preaching and teaching the Word. So we need people to serve. That's the Greek word for deacon. We need deacons. Now, as Luke writes about these deacons and he explains how the elders went about um, ordaining the deacons, There are also more general principles that apply to all of us. And it's no mistake that Luke uses the word disciple for the first time in the book of Acts three separate times. All the deacons are, are particularly gifted in godly disciples, but they're disciples. And all the elders are, are are simply particularly gifted and called disciples. So as we see the characteristics or qualities or marks of these first deacons, we actually see the qualities, characteristics, and marks of every disciple. But these deacons just had them in greater maturity. So as we are disciples going further up and further into Christ, the marks of these first deacons are what we're supposed to pursue in Christ. By the way, let me just say at the front end, we have incredible deacons in this church. They are running further up and further in, and we couldn't be more thankful as elders. I couldn't be more thankful as one of the pastors here for the deacons that we have in our church. But let's dig in. Four ways we're called to go further up and further in to Christ. First of all, Go further up and further in the means of grace. I said the the elders, the apostles, are models for us as well. You know, Christ chose them as disciples, that they would learn of him, they would be his apprentices. And then he said to those 12, you go make disciples as well. And all the way down, the church is to be involved in making disciples. So what can we learn about what we're supposed to pursue by looking at the elders and deacons. Well, in verse 4, the elders, the apostles, were devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Now, in many corners of the church, these are called the spiritual disciplines. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I particularly like to call them the means of grace because I have such a tendency to put myself under performance with God. Maybe you can relate to that. I I have such a tendency to think that if I engage in the disciplines, then God's going to love me more. But if I fail to engage in the disciplines, God's going to love me less and maybe not even bless my appointments that day. I don't know if you wrestle with that, but I do. By changing the semantics from the spiritual disciplines to the means of grace, my focus is changed from performance to the promises. And I'm led to recognize that I don't engage in the spiritual disciplines because I'm trying to work real hard to have it together. I engage in the means of grace because I'm a broken, empty vessel that desperately needs to be filled. So that if I do engage in prayer and I do engage in the ministry of the Word, reading it, memorizing it, studying it, There's no room for pride because the whole point of it being a means of grace is that I'm I'm an empty vessel. And the only conduit that God uses to fill this empty vessel are the means of grace. It's like God's rain showers and I simply receive the rain. 
That's what the means of grace are. And he talks about the means of grace of prayer and the means of grace of the Word. Look at verse 7. It says, The Word of God continue increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied. Now, Luke didn't just write Luke. Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Luke uses the same terminology here in this chapter when he talks about the disciples increasing and multiplying and the word increasing and multiplying, as Jesus used, recorded by Luke, in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the soils. Jesus says some of the word, the seed, fell on good soil. And the seed, the word sprouted and bore fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold. Do you hear the invitation of Jesus to spend time in the word? Not because you want to be good. Not because you're going to be more committed. But because the Word is the seed of God. And He promises that it will bear fruit in your life 30, 60, and 100 fold. Prayer and the Word are means of grace for starving souls. The table is set. We do nothing to set the table. All we do is come and eat. That's why I love means of grace. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul says, I commit you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of God is able to give you life. Are you looking for life? Are you looking for energy? Are you looking for hope? Are you looking for peace? Are you looking for anything? The Word of God is what gives it to you. It's the fuel that makes the Christian life go along with prayer. It's the like oxygen to a brain. So are the means of grace to the Christian. It's what leads us further up and further in to Christ. Our daughter, Hannah, uh, introduced us to an organization, a ministry that I I hate to admit, I knew nothing about. Uh, When she was at Auburn, she and a friend of hers started uh, International Justice Mission at Auburn University. And I never knew what International Justice Mission was, but it's a nonprofit that combats uh, sexual trafficking, but also other forms of violence and oppression against the poor. Uh, The founder of IJM is a man named Gary Haugen. Gary Haugen is a Harvard grad. He also graduated from the University of Chicago Law School. He's no dummy. He was uh, hired by the United States Justice Department to actually be the officer in charge investigating the Rwandan genocide. After he had done all that, he started IJM. And when he started IJM, he laid down a principle that every staff member in every office around the entire world, when they report to their desk, the first thing that they are offered, offered like you will do this, is 30 minutes to spend time in the Word, to spend time with Jesus. They're, they're on the clock. They're getting paid the first 30 minutes to spend time with Jesus. Once a quarter, every IJM office has a quarterly spiritual retreat where they get away for fellowship, silence, study. And then every IJM staff member is given one day a year to take a private spiritual retreat. That may seem like a luxury. Some of you are thinking, I have a company, but I can't afford that. Well, Gary Haugen's been around the world. And he said this, I've learned that prayerless striving will only lead to exhaustion. He says, I've learned just how crucial it is to settle my soul in the presence of Jesus every single morning. And even though it is tempting to hurry into our work, we intentionally must still ourselves and connect with our maker, the God who delights in restoring 
and encouraging his children. See, that's the means of grace. The means of grace, prayer and the word, are the conduits by which the Father encourages you and gives you life. It is not, you losers better do this, doggone it. It's, do you realize, do you realize the opportunity the Father gives you to drink of his word and prayer and to receive life and encouragement from his hand. Disciples are always going further up and further in the means of grace. Secondly, go further up and further into spiritual wisdom. Not only is disciple repeated as a word throughout this passage, but the word wisdom is repeated again and again. Verse 3, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom. Verse 10, they could not withstand the wisdom and the Spirit with which he was speaking. And even where the Word doesn't show up, the apostles and the deacons show and exhibit incredible wisdom in this passage. Let's start with a definition. What is wisdom? I'll give it to you a couple times here. Wisdom is the ability to apply God's Word in the right way at the right time with the right heart. I'll say it again. Wisdom is the ability to apply God's Word in the right way at the right time with the right heart. You know, the apostles were not brains on a stick. Please do not equate wisdom with knowledge. There's a lot of people who know a lot of stuff that are not very wise. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge at the right time, in the right way, with the right heart. And the disciples of Jesus showed great wisdom in handling conflict. You know why there's so much destructive conflict in our lives? Because we lack wisdom. We need wisdom to handle conflict constructively. If you notice verse 5, all the names of the first deacons, they're all Greek names. Corporate wisdom. See, the conflict had to revolve around Greek-speaking Jews who were being overlooked as far as their widows when it came to the daily distribution of food. Wisdom involves knowledge and sensitivity. The, the first century church looked at the problem and then understanding God's Word and applying it in the right way at the right time with the right heart, these people felt heard. The Hellenists felt seen. And just knowledge and teaching wouldn't have done that. It took people living wisely who showed them that they were loved. And then Stephen in verse 10, but also the entire, book, the entire chapter 7 of the book of Acts, it's the right use of the word to handle people's opposition. You know, so often in the church, we know a lot, and we try to destroy people with our knowledge. I, I've been witness to debates between Christians and atheists, and the Christian blew the atheist away. I mean, he was a bloody, puddled mess of embarrassment. And nobody in the crowd wanted anything to do with Jesus. Jesus. See, with our knowledge, we can actually win the battle and lose the war. Winsome is attractive. Wisdom is attractive. Wisdom is winsome. Wisdom is the right use of the Bible at the right time, in the right way, with the right heart. Now, Stephen's use of wisdom didn't have a good end, 
as far as we might be concerned. He was the first martyr. And yet, God used that to spread the church in ways that it never would have been spread otherwise. And so ultimately, it was wisdom that led to the increase of the church. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 7, you'll see that um, many of the priests came to faith. Now, the priests were the ones that most opposed, opposed Jesus when he was alive. And, and Jesus was at times the most harsh with the priests. Now, you need to know there are different levels of priests. There was, there was the high priestly family and the high priestly organization, but there, there were just hundreds, if not thousands, of, of lower level priests. And I really believe that Luke is telling us when the first century church treated the Hellenist widows with wisdom and sensitivity and kindness and handled conflict wisely, that those lower priests said, oh my, there is something to this Jesus thing after all. And many of the priests came to Christ because of the Spirit using the wisdom of the elders and the deacons and the church. Where do you need to go further up and further in to wisdom in order to grow in Christ? And then thirdly, two points real quick. Go further up and further in holistic Christ-likeness. One thing I love about this passage is it's very holistic when it comes to what Christ-likeness is. When I say the word Christ-likeness, because we're in America and because we're in Birmingham, I almost have an idea already of what you're thinking. When I say Christ-likeness, most of us are thinking of what would commonly be referred to as conservative uh, social values, conservative family values. And, and of course, uh, that would be pretty accurate as far as it goes. And so look at verse 3. When it comes to the first deacons, again being model disciples, the apostles say, uh, choose seven men of good repute. Well, that means they have a Christ-likeness in their ethical ideals. It means they behave in such a way that is very moral and good, much like Christ carried himself in obedience to the Word of God. But what I love about this passage is, is it reminds us that Christ's likeness is not just avoiding the dirty dozen, the filthy five, the nasty nine, the awful eight, though it does involve that. Christ's likeness is not just positive ethical values like telling the truth and working hard and remaining sexually pure, although it does involve that. Holiness has just as much to do with mercy and justice as it has to do with what we call conservative values. And that's why in verse 3, these seven men were appointed to this duty, this duty of taking care of people who were being overlooked. Like, this is what Jesus did. Jesus went to the poor. As a matter of fact, at the end of his life, when it came to understanding how the judgment's going to occur, now we know how the judgment's going to occur because it all comes down to whether you have faith in Christ or not. But if you have faith in Christ, it's going to lead to a kind of a lifestyle. That's the holistic Christ-likeness we're talking about. And so the assumption Jesus makes in giving, the, par or giving the, the story of the end of the age is that we know we're not saved by works. We know we're not saved by our own efforts at righteousness. We know we're saved by a, a righteousness that, that is outside of ourselves that Jesus purchased that comes to us. Having said all that, Matthew 25 can be confusing if you don't know that. Because in Matthew 25, he says, I'm going to separate the sheep and the goats. And the goats are on my left. And they're going to go off into hell. And you know who they are? The people that saw the thirsty and never gave them a drink. And the people that saw the hungry and never gave them something to eat. And the people that saw the naked and never gave them clothes. 
And the people that saw people who were sick and in prison, and they never visited them. Christ's likeness is holistic. And Jesus cares as much about caring for the oppressed and the poor as he does about making sure you don't sleep with a prostitute. And some of us don't believe that. Pete coming in uh, next week. I, I can't wait to see him. In all of my travels, especially around Europe, uh, I've come to uh, an, uh, an interesting um, conclusion about American evangelicals and European evangelicals. Okay, an evangelical, we're going to say for the time being, is someone who really trusts in Christ and really believes the Bible and is seeking to follow it, okay? When we talk about holistic Christ-likeness, both groups are not holistic, generally. Both groups are extremists. Both groups are polarized. And here's what I mean. Have you ever run into a, a European that says, how can you American Christians, how, how could you vote for that guy? Okay? And then they'll hold to things, and we think, how could you European Christians, how could you even not think about that issue? Here's why. European evangelicals, this is a generalization, tend to emphasize an ethic that flows out of the four Gospels. Jesus' ethic. The ethic of the four Gospels tends to be really heavy on taking care of the poor, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, freeing the oppressed. Clearly, it is Christ-likeness. Now, American evangelicals, interestingly enough, we tend to get our ethic from the Pauline epistles. Don't get drunk. Tell the truth. Work hard. Conservative family values. Now, does Paul give us moral ethics like that? Of course he does. That's part of Christ-likeness. But people, it is not an either-or. It is a both-and. We are called to holistic Christ-likeness. And where do you this morning need to go further up and further in? Do you need to grow further up and further in the ethics of the Gospels? I would assume most of us here do. Are you primarily camped out in what you think are the ethics of the epistles? See, we need to understand our environment. And a disciple follows Christ. Not the church environment of his or her country or continent. And then lastly, fourthly, finally, go further up and further in spirit-filled faith. Now look, this is the most important part of all. When we talk about disciple and discipleship, much discipleship in the church in our day is moralistic. It's behavioralism. Baptized with the name Jesus. It focuses completely on behaviors or it emphasizes competencies which you need to develop. And as far as it goes, that is true. That's part of what it means to go further up and further in. But you can't get there through self-effort. You, you can't get there by just being more committed or gutting it out or trying harder. That's why in verse 3 we read that these first deacons who were model disciples to the rest of us who were disciples, they were full of the Spirit. That is the key to moving further up and further in. We need to be full of the Spirit. How are we full of the Spirit? Well, look at verse 5. Stephen was a model of someone being full of faith. Faith in Christ, faith in the promises of the gospel, faith is how we grow further up and further in. Look, if you had one opportunity to ask Jesus anything you wanted, what would it be? Well, you know, a group had that opportunity in John chapter 6. 
And this was their question. Jesus, <laughs> look, just what's the one thing we need to focus on? John 6, 28 and 29. What, what's the one thing we're supposed to do to do the work of God? You know what Jesus said? Think about this. The one thing. In other words, you, you may want to get out your pen and paper here, folks. The one thing. Jesus said the one thing is this. To believe in the one whom he has sent. That's a pretty clear summation of what it means to be a disciple. To keep on believing, trusting, resting in Christ. It says in verse 7 that the disciples multiplied greatly and many priests became obedient to the faith. You talk about obedience? You want to focus on obedience? I do too. And guess what the first act of obedience must always be? Obeying the call to trust in Christ. Now, you may be here this morning and you don't know Christ, so your first act of obedience is to put your hope and trust in the finished work of Christ. Rest in His record of righteousness and not your own. But most of us here, we're already disciples. So what do you do to move further up and further in? You put your trust in Christ. You believe that He is willing and able to change you, to make you holistic, to give you wisdom, to inspire you to take advantage of the means of grace. And in Oak Mountain, what am I going to say? You know what I'm going to say next. The way you go further up and further in is you waltz. If you're new here this morning, the waltz is how we describe the spirit-filled life, abiding in Christ, going further up, further in. The waltz is three-step, one, two, three, one, two, three. Repent, believe, fight, repent, believe, fight. That's how you go further up, further in. Keep going further up and further in to repentance. Keep going further up, further in to faith in Christ. Trusting the Spirit will change you at the place of your repentance. And then, yes, keep going further up, further in to the obedience, not only of faith, but of holistic Christ-likeness. Yes, there's a life to live. Yes, there's things we ought not to do. Yes, there's things we're supposed to do. And yes, part of the to-do is mercy and justice. You know, throughout the Bible, when God's doing something special, He often gives a name change. Abram, exalted father, pretty arrogant name. Abraham, father of many nations that God will bring about. Jacob, deceiver. I'm going to get what I want by hook or by crook. Israel, wrestles with God things just got vertical and it happens on and on Simon means to hear Peter means rock maybe it's time for a name change this morning what's your name I know what God wants to change it to Not convert, not churchgoer, not even believer, but disciple. If you know Christ, you're a disciple. And Jesus is calling you further up and further in to all that he has for you and all that he wants from you. Let's pray. Father, uh, we confess that we fail so often to be the disciples that you've called us to be. So Lord, help us to really spend some time this week reflecting on this passage. God, where do we need to go further up and further in the means of grace? Where do we need to go further up and further into spiritual wisdom? God, where do we need to go further up, further in, holistic Christ-likeness? And God, we all know we need to go further up and further into faith. 
And so Jesus, have mercy on us. We are your disciples. And you love that. You delight in that. And so Jesus, keep discipling us. For your glory and for our good. Amen. Let's all stand here. The benediction. We, we leave this place this morning with the promise and the hope that Jesus...